everyone. I'm going to go straight into the review of conceptual topics. Okay. Perhaps one of the uh, most important things that you'll have to do on the final exam is to determine which uh, method to apply to a certain problem. So if you've taken a look at the practice final exam, you'll notice that there have been, um, you know, I'll write a paragraph and I'll have maybe four or five questions related to that original paragraph of questions or paragraph that describes the situation. So when you read that paragraph, you're going to have to decide whether you have uh, one sample or two samples. And whether you are dealing with proportions or means. You'll also have to figure out whether you are dealing with confidence intervals or uh, hypothesis tests. Okay. So uh, the distinction between confidence intervals and hypothesis tests, uh, I think, should be uh, quite clear. But it is important that you you understand which one's a con confidence interval and hypothesis test. So uh, we'll cover this one first because I think it's the most straightforward. So clearly, if, uh, if the problem says, if the problem mentions hypotheses, then you are dealing with a hypothesis test. And, and that's probably going to um, be the clearest indicator that you are dealing with a hypothesis test. So if the problem mentions hypotheses, hypotheses, or, um, or really a p-value, so these are going to be your two kind of biggest things indicating that you're dealing with a hypothesis test. Um, then, uh, then it's a hypothesis test, okay? And if there's no mention of these things, then it's probably a confidence interval. Um, if the problem mentions a confidence level, then that's going to be a confidence interval. Okay, so just look for kind of key words like confidence or p-value or hypotheses in the questions that are related to the problem setup. But in the problem setup, it's important that we can Id identify whether we're dealing with proportions or means, whether we have one sample or two samples, okay? And so if the problem is a categorical, has a categorical variable, then you are dealing with proportions. Okay. Um, other key words here will be uh, will be the mention of a proportion. <laughs> okay. And I'm trying to think um, if uh, or um, or the data is provided in counts. Okay. So it will say something like, your sample had 250 people, and in that 250 people, you know, 70 of them, whatever, had brown hair or something like that. So it's providing a count of how many people had brown hair, okay? On the other hand, if the problem is, has a numeric variable, then you will be dealing with means. Okay, and so uh, keywords here, things like mean or average. Also, uh, if a standard deviation is provided, standard deviation is provided, then that's a good indication that you are dealing with a numeric variable uh, with means. Okay. Uh, determining how many samples do you have will 
Well, for this, you want to be able to count or identify how many ends can you find, okay? So, how many sample size n, sample sizes or ends can you find? Okay, so if you can only find one end, so read the problem carefully, and if you can only find one n, then you only have one sample. Okay. Then you have one sample. And on obviously, if you have find two n's, then you have two samples. But it's very important that, you know, because we've covered, you know, one sample proportion confidence interval, uh, one sample proportion hypothesis test, one sample mean confidence interval, one sample mean hypothesis test, you know, two sample proportion hypothesis test, two sample means confidence interval, two sample means hypothesis test. And then we have all of these things that you need to... Uh, to know and uh, and the formulas are nicely laid out for you on the formula sheet but if you apply the wrong set of formulas to uh, a, a problem then your answers will certainly be wrong and, and you'll, you'll miss uh, a bunch of questions so I don't want that to happen to you guys and so please make sure you can correctly identify uh, which which method should be used okay so this is uh, Wednesday. Okay. All right. So let's uh, let's try a few examples here, and um, kind of in the interest of time, I'm going to um, you know place these questions up on here, and I'm going to um, I'm going to tell you to pause the video, and. Uh, and you should pause while you're trying to figure out your answers, okay? So here uh, it says, a researcher wants to know if the rate of teen pregnancy has changed. In 1995, the rate was found to be 8%. A recent study surveyed 1,200 random se randomly selected female teenagers and found that 103 had teen pregnancies, okay? So is this one sample or two samples, means or proportions, okay? Same type of question over here. Um, a teacher wishes to know if the performance of a student has changed between quarters. Last quarter, there were 150 students in his class. The average grade was 87% with a standard deviation of 12%. This quarter, he has 160 students, and the average grade is 90% with a standard deviation of 10%. What situation is this? Again, one sample or two samples means or proportions. Uh, go ahead and take a moment here to figure out what your answers are, uh, you can pause the video. So pause it now because in just a few seconds I will go over the answer. Okay, I will go over the answers here. If you don't want to see the answers, pause your video. All right, so when we look at this one, it says uh, the rate was found to be 8%. A recent study surveyed 1,200 randomly selected female teenagers and found that 103 had teen pregnancies. So here we are looking at whether uh, a teenager was pregnant or not. And so the number 103, this is a count. And here we have uh, kind of a sample size. This is the n. And there's only one n. Even though we've got another percentage here, um, there's no sample size associated with this percentage. Okay, so this, sample, this percentage is 8%. That's just going to be uh, the percentage there. So here we've got one sample where n is equal to 1,200. And we have a count of how many people were pregnant, so we are dealing with a categorical variable. And so we've got proportions going on. Okay, and then we'll have to look at the related questions to see if this is a confidence interval or a hypothesis test. So this is one sample and proportions. Looking at this question, it says a teacher wishes to know if the performance of his students has changed between quarters. 
last quarter there was 150 students in his class, okay? And, uh, and this quarter there's 160 students. So we can identify two samples. One, sample one has uh, 150 students, so n1 is equal to 150, and sample two, n2 is equal to 160. So we've got two samples, whatever it is, we've got two samples. All right, when we look at this, we've got 87%, um, and so it looks like it could be a proportion, but it's not, because it talks about the average grade, and it also says that there's a standard deviation. So because we see um, the average grade being 87, and associated with that is a standard deviation, we are dealing with a numeric variable, which is really um, the class grade. And so this is going to be a situation where we are dealing with means. So here we've got two sample means. Up here we've got one sample proportion. Okay. And so this, the way you identify which um, type of question you're dealing with, that's going to be uh, increasingly important or, or just very important in the, uh, in the final exam. Okay, so I've created a series of true-false questions here, and so, um, you know, let me see if I can zoom in here. And so, um, let's, uh, I'm going to copy these onto, uh, onto the next slide here, and uh, we'll, we'll go through these, okay. Okay, so it says you create a confidence interval for mu, being uh, the population mean mu, okay? And the interval goes from 1.2 to 3.5. So this is going to be the lower bound and the upper bound of our interval. And so here I've got a series of true-false questions, and it says, true or false, our confidence interval provides evidence that the population mean is not zero. True or false, our confidence interval provides evidence that the population mean is not 2.5. And true or false, our confidence interval provides evidence that the population mean is 2.5, okay? So again, um, I'm going to go over the answers in just a moment. Uh, so take a moment to pause the video and figure out your answers. Okay, I'm going to go over the answers here. So let's take a look at the first one. Our confidence interval provides evidence that the population mean is not zero. Okay, so what we do is we see that zero is not between 1.2 and 3.5. So this means that zero is not a plausible value for mu. And thus, we would conclude that this statement is true. Our confidence interval does provide evidence that the population mean is not zero. Okay. However, our, um, the population mean could be zero. Okay. So we have evidence that mu is not zero, but mu could be zero. Let's take a look at the next sentence. It says, our confidence interval provides evidence that the population mean is not 2.5, okay? And so what we see is that 2.5 is between 1.2 and 3.5. So 2.5 is a plausible value for mu. And so we would say um, we do not have evidence that mu is not 2.5. Okay, so we don't have evidence that mu is something other than 2.5. So this statement is false. Okay. And the last one says our confidence interval provides evidence that the population mean is 2.5, okay? And so this part is still true. 2.5 is between 1.2 and 3.5. It's inside our interval, right? So 2.5 is a plausible value for mu, 
okay? But our confidence interval never provides evidence that mu is a particular value. That mu is equal to a particular value. Okay, so I hope this makes sense. I'm going to keep going on here. Of course, at any time, you can always pause the video and make sure you understand all of these things that I've talked about. Okay, so here we're still dealing with a um, set of confidence intervals. Actually, I gotta let me increase uh, the amount of space I have here. So we've got the same confidence interval, 95% confidence interval for mu, and it goes from 1.2 to 3.5. All right, and so it says, you know, here are four statements. Again, pause the video and see if you can answer them. I think uh, I'll save my breath and not actually read them to you because I know you guys had to know how to read. So um, just pause the video here, figure out, decide whether each of these statements are true or false, and then we'll go over the answers. Okay, so we are going to go over each of these answers. So it says, there is a 95% probability that the population mean is between 1.2 and 3.5. All right, and so this answer is false. Okay, the population mean mu is a fixed value of which, about which there is no uncertainty. is a fixed but unknown value. Okay, there's no uncertainty. So, so it does not make sense to talk about probability. There's no probability associated with mu. It is just some number that we don't know. Of course, this is taking the frequentist view that we have been using in this class, um, but you know, this isn't Bayesian statistics. So, okay, number two or our second sentence: ninety-five percent of the values in the population are between one point two and three point five. This statement again. This statement is false. Okay, so the confidence interval is not about the values in the population. Okay, it is merely a statement of confidence about the population mean, mu. Okay, the CI is a statement of confidence. for mu. The next one says 95% of the samples will have sample means between 1.2 and 3.5. This also is false, okay? The CI is not about sample means. Okay, that's a confidence interval. 
The confidence interval is a statement of confidence for mu, the population mu. Or if you're dealing with p, then the population proportion. All right, and this sentence says, if 100 samples were drawn from the population and each sample produced a 95% confidence interval, we would expect 95% of those confidence intervals to capture the true population mean. This one is true, okay? So when we create a 95% confidence interval based on a random sample, we are expecting 95% of those resulting confidence intervals to capture the true population mean. Okay, so this, this statement is true. So you can read through it carefully, and that's this is where the 95% confidence comes from, meaning that you know when we create a confidence interval, we don't know if it's the, in the 95% that captures the true population mean or if it's in the 5% that did not. Um, but overall, whenever you take a random sample, 95% of those random samples will produce confidence intervals that get the population mean mu. And so that's why we can say we are 95% confident. Let's take a look at... Uh, All right, so let's. Uh, so now we are going to talk about some uh, hypothesis tests, and uh, in this one, this is a little silly here. Um, it says you perform a hypothesis test to see if the proportion of people who like Vitamina Vegemin is less than 0.75. This is uh, in a I Love Lucy reference TV show, and whatever. Okay, the p value for this test is. 0.01. You used an alpha of 0.05. All right. So which statement of these is true? So let's go ahead and uh, let me copy these uh, these statement choices here. All right. So we have evidence that the population proportion is 0.75. We do not have evidence. That, okay, so anyway, you can read this. And um, pick your answer choice. I am going to reveal the correct answer right now. All right. So um, it says you've performed a hypothesis test to see if um, the proportion of those who like vitamin Vita Vegemin is less than 0 0.75. So let's figure out what our hypotheses should be. So it's a hypothesis test about proportions. So our null hypothesis always has an equal sign. And this one, we only have um, basically just one proportion that we're looking at. So we want to know, is P equal to 0.75? The null hypothesis always has an equal. And then over here, it's asking about is less. So our alternative will be p is less than 0.75. So this is our um, set of hypotheses here. Okay, And what we have is our p-value is equal to 0.01. That's what it says right here. The p-value for this test is 0.01. And we used alpha equal to 0.05. So what we have here is that our p-value as it is, is less than alpha, and this means we will reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so let's see which of these statements match up with rejecting the null hypothesis. Okay, um, We have evidence that the population proportion is 0.75. So this here is basically saying um, we say that the null hypothesis is true. So we conclude null hypothesis is true, okay? And that's actually not even a conclusion that is allowed. We never say that the null hypothesis is true, okay? We either reject or we do not reject the null, okay? And over here it says we do not have evidence that the population proportion is 0.75, okay? So here it's like um, we don't conclude that the null hypothesis is true, okay? again. We never actually say that the null hypothesis is true or not. We either reject or do not reject the null. 
rejecting the null is equivalent to saying um, that we accept the alternative, okay? So rejecting the null is accepting the alternative, okay? So this also here is um, saying we, we do not have evidence that the population proportion is 0.75. This is uh, also a nonsense conclusion because uh, we would never say that the null is um, true or here we're saying uh, do not conclude null is true. Here it says we have evidence that the population proportion is less than 0.75. So we, here it's we conclude um, the alternative is true, which means that the null is false. And here it says uh, we do not conclude that the alternative is true. Okay, so just from reading these, we can eliminate A and B off the bat because these are saying things like we accept the alternative or we don't accept, I mean, we accept the null or we don't accept the null. And, and we never say that we accept or um, anything about the null. It's always we've either rejected the null, which is what C is, or we don't reject the null, which is what D says. So in this case, we have rejected the null, so C is true. So this is the correct statement. This one, D, would be correct if the p-value were greater than 0.05. Okay, so D would be correct if the p-value were greater than 0.05. So uh, again, you can read through this question, and um, you can pause the video to make your decision. Okay, and now I'm going to go over the answer here. So again, our null hypothesis, it's the, uh, the same setup as before, so we have p is equal to 0.75, and our alternative is that p is less than 0.75, okay? And so, are uh, the allowable conclusions are either we reject the null hypothesis, which is uh, saying the same thing as we support or accept the alternative, or we do not reject the null hypothesis. which says uh, we do not support the alternative. Okay, And so in our case, our p-value is 0.01. And so this means our p-value is less than our choice of alpha, which leads to rejecting the null hypothesis. Now when we look at this, it says we have evidence to support the null, we don't have evidence to support the null, we have evidence to support the alternative, or we don't have evidence to support the alternative. Okay, and so in this case, we go with rejecting the null, which is equivalent to supporting the alternative. So again, our answer choice is C. We have evidence to support the alternative. Okay, and again, A and B are eliminated right off the bat because we never say we support um, the null hypothesis. So it's either gonna be C or D. And because our p-value is less than alpha, we're going to say we have evidence to support the alternative. All right. Um, the next set of questions is almost um, identical, except I've just uh, inverted the uh, 
kind of the verb into uh, from supporting to rejecting. Okay. So take a few seconds to make your decision about which conclusion is correct. Okay, I'm going to go over the answer and um, as always, if you haven't made your decision yet, just pause the video right now and um, pick your answer. Okay, so once again, um, our p-value is less than alpha. And the null and alternative hypotheses were the same as before. And so in this case, we are going to reject the null hypothesis. And so statement A is correct. We have evidence to reject the null, OK? And, uh, and C and D we can eliminate right off the bat because we don't, we don't ever talk about rejecting the alternative or not rejecting the alternative, OK? We either reject or not reject the null. We either support or don't support the alternative. So C and D are not allowed right off the bat. B would be correct only if correct if the p-value ended up greater than alpha. Let's, uh, let's talk about this next one. And here we are trying to uh, decide which set of hypotheses would be correct for this uh, made-up problem here. It says, you want to create a hypothesis test to see if the proportion of North Campus students who read novels for pleasure is greater than the proportion of South Campus students who read novels for pleasure. Okay. So what would the appropriate hypotheses be? So we've got a, a few choices here, you know, p1 equal to p2. This uh, exclamation equal, this um, exclamation equals means uh, is the same thing as the not equal to sign. Okay, so this is in computer programming, this is how you'd write that. So anyway, go ahead and look at these uh, hypotheses that would be allowed or you know make your choice pause the video if you need to okay let's uh, go over the answer so uh, right off the bat we can eliminate answer choice B and answer choice C because the null hypothesis always has an equal sign Okay, and that's, that's going to always be the case for all hypotheses tests. So B and C, these are uh, not going to work because we've got something other than an equal sign in the null hypothesis. All right, so really it comes down to our null hypothesis being P1 equal to P2 versus the alternative that P1 does not equal P2. This is answer choice A. And answer choice C is says that the null is that p1 is equal to p2 and the alternative is that p1 is greater than p2 okay now i do want to point out that sometimes and this uh, this is how they appear in the practice final and so i don't want anybody to be scared is to say that p1 and p2 are equal is exactly the same thing as saying p1 minus p2 equals 0 and then to say that p1 and p2 are not equal to each other is exactly the same thing as p1 minus p2 is not equal to 0. Okay, And so these things are all um, equivalent to each other, the alternative being p1 minus p2. And this is just via algebraic manipulation would be that p1 minus p2 is greater than 0. So let's take a look. And so it says you want to create a hypothesis test to see if the proportion of North Campus students who read uh, novels for pleasure is greater than the proportion of South Campus students. So here we're going to assume that P1 is for North Campus and P2 is going to be South Campus. Now um, 
And because we are having the uh, greater than sign, we, we're going to choose answer choice C, okay? Um, if we had another one where it was P1 is less than P2, then it really will depend on how uh, you have assigned the labels of P1 and P2. Um, in the final exam that I've written, I've tried to make it very clear which sample is sample 1, which sample is sample 2, so that there won't be confusion about is this one for P1 or is this one for P2? I've tried to make that as clear as possible. Of course, as any, if anything is unclear during the exam, just raise your hand and I'll try to answer. Okay, well, let's, uh, let me see if I can uh, get this all onto one page here. All right, and then so for our last uh, example problem for uh, conceptual topics is uh, right here. And let's see. Okay, so it says doctors can administer an STD test, and the test would assume that the person is STD free unless they show symptoms of having a disease. All right, so um, if we're assuming that the person has no disease or is STD free unless there is symptoms of something uh, wrong, that means our null hypothesis is that the patient is disease free, and the alternative will be that the patient has an STD. Okay, and here we have a few questions or answer choices, and it says type 1 error is worse than type 2 error, so we would pick a large alpha or we would pick a small alpha. And, or type 2 errors worse than type 1 error, so we would pick a large alpha or we would pick a small alpha. So uh, take a moment here to figure out what exactly a type 1 error would mean in this situation, what exactly a type 2 error would mean in this situation, and whether that means you would want a large alpha or a small alpha. Okay, so um, again, pause the video to make your decision and figure this out, and we will go over the answer. Okay, so I'm going to cover the answer now. So let's see exactly what a type 1 error would be in this scenario. So type 1 error means the null hypothesis is true, but we mistakenly reject the null hypothesis. Type 2 error is that the null hypothesis is false and should be rejected, but we make the mistake of we do not reject the null hypothesis. So that's an error. OK, so what does that mean in this problem? OK, so for a type 1 error, the null hypothesis is true, meaning the patient is disease free. So reality disease-free, but our conclusion is that uh, we've rejected the null. Conclusion is, you know, we think patient has disease. Now, that's, um, now that's a mistake, and we don't want that. But let's take a look at what a type 2 error is, OK? So the reality in this situation is that the null hypothesis is false, meaning that the patient has an STD, OK? OK, but our conclusion here is that we did not reject the null hypothesis. So we think patient does not have STD. So both of these we don't want. These are both situations that we don't want. But if we take a look at these, I, I would believe, or I think we would agree, that the type 2 error is worse than the type 1 error. And the type 2 error, the person actually has a disease but doesn't know it and so may un unknowingly spread it to others and cause other people to have the disease. Type 1 error is 
certainly um, not ideal, but in reality this person is healthy and um, just comes to the wrong conclusion that, uh, that he or she has a disease. But that, um, and so of course that's, that's undesirable, but uh, type 2 could, could certainly be an epidemiological problem here, okay? So we would say the type 2 error is worse, okay? So um, we're going to get rid of answer choices A and B and say that type 2 error is worse than type 1 error. So would we pick a large alpha or would we pick a small alpha? Okay. So with, um, if we recall, um, alpha is equal to the probability of a type 1 error. Okay. And the relationship between uh, committing a type 1 error and committing a type 2 error is that large uh, alpha means more type 1 error less type 2. Okay, on the other hand, small alpha means uh, less type 1 and more type 2. Okay, and so because we think that the patient, uh, because we think that, I'm sorry, a type 2 error is worse than the type 1 error, we would rather have more type 1 and less type 2, and so we would choose a large alpha. So C is going to be the correct answer choice. Okay? Type 2 error is worse than type 1 error, so we would pick a large alpha. So this means more type 1 error and less of type 2. Okay, that's, uh, this is kind of the abbreviated version of what I was going to cover in uh, today's lecture. I hope this uh, review material has been helpful. You will see a few questions in the conceptual part of the final exam that are, in my opinion, very similar to the questions presented here. So uh, some of those questions on the final, uh, I believe, will be quite similar to this. Best wishes as you guys study. I'll see you guys on Friday.